one should give us the yellow bird now, which I, I don't think we can use. I don't think it's good enough for the um, super car championship. I remember trying to use it there. It's not good enough. Would you excuse me for a moment? It's safe to say Gran Turismo challenge runs have become quite popular in the last months. Even I tried my hand at some of them. I find the magic of this lies on pushing cars to their absolute limit and achieving results which one might not think possible at first sight. Which is my intention if we manage to reach 50 patrons, as I will drive a fourth car for 9 hours in my current Gran Turismo 4 randomizer playthrough, which I'm streaming here on YouTube. This run has been played completely with A-Spec mode, meaning I drove each race by myself. While it will take a special build to make this monumental task possible, it happens to be possible. Also, if you decide to join my Patreon, you will get early access to my videos along with a shoutout at the end of each one, and a special role on my Discord server, which you can find in the description of this video, along with my Patreon. The fourth guy is waiting for you, and a few rust spots are starting to show, but I'll drive it, rusted or not, because your entertainment is more important than my safety. Considering my interest in pushing cars to their limits, I decided to use the car which this channel is named after. In in order to see how much one can achieve with it, and the list of achievements is quite impressive, yes, there's even a rally race. In order to understand how to push this car to its true limits, we have to get a bit technical. At first glance, I can understand those who start to drive this car and dismiss it as undrivable. The Yellow Bird is one of the few cars with a rear engine layout. This means the engine is sitting past the rear axle, towards the end of the car. This fact alone is key as it means the weight distribution of the Yellow Bird is completely different to other cars. Usually cars cars have more weight at the front or happen to have an even 50-50 split. Front heavy cars tend to understeer, while rear heavy cars tend to oversteer as a rule of thumb. While rear engine cars are at slower at corner entry, they make up with excellent traction at corner exit, allowing them to carry more speed. Once you adapt to this different driving style, the yellow bird looks even brighter than before, as bright as you do when you leave a like on this video, and subscribe for future videos and live streams. Will you believe most of my audience isn't subscribed? While the engine layout in itself defines the driving experience of the yellow bird, there is more information which has to be taken into account. While looking at the hidden stats of the yellow bird, we can discover another feature which shapes its driving experience. It has one of the lowest grip modifiers in the entire game. What are grip modifiers? Basically, they are a chassis stat that resembles mechanical grip, and higher grip modifiers means better response while turning, and more grip at your disposal while exiting corners. It is another reason why the car feels so unwilling to turn in, compared to others. Usually these issues can be fixed with our good friend the GT Wing, but the Yellow Bird doesn't have said option. Turn off BTR does, however, for some bizarre reason. Lower grip modifiers are a handicap unlike its engine layout, however, it can be improved with a few setup changes. First of all, one has to install every stage of weight reduction, buy and install a racing suspension kit, a fully customizable limited slip differential, and all drivetrain upgrades while you're at it, they will come in handy later, and a brake balance distributor. The most important changes are made to its suspension. Front camber is increased to 3.5 degrees, while rear camber remains at 1.5. You can play with these angles, but front camber has to remain high in order to eliminate the snap oversteer in corner entry. I wouldn't worry about tire wear as it doesn't seem to have a substantial effect on the front tires, given they have next to no weight over it. Ride height is also important, but this is a feature which depends on each circuit. I find the average ride height should be 110 to 115 mm, and it should remain equal on both axles. If ride height is too low, the car will lose grip. Spring ratios should also vary depending on the circuit, but I find running 7 and 8 at the front and rear respectively works well. This setting should allow for a slight amount of body roll which makes the car more consistent to drive. Stiff springs and low ride height aren't effective in Gran Turismo 4, but you don't want to end with a boat either. One has to play and test each car until it responds in a manner which feels consistent for each driver. Shock bounds are softer than rebounds in order to help with turning issues as well. I will leave the suspension setup on the screen if you wish to copy it. As always, remember that Gran Turismo 4 physics are different from real life, and each game has its own physics model, with its own quirks. I know GT4 has this reputation as the real understeer simulator and all, but I don't find this is the case after one learns to turn cars properly. I never thought I would change my views on this game. The limited slip differential or LST is also important as it fixes one of the most annoying issues of the Yellowbird, its unstable rear under braking. To correct this issue, 
Ratio 1 wants to raise the acceleration to at least 40 to 50. You are free to experiment with this, but I found anything below 40 isn't enough. Given the car doesn't experience wheel spin in most circumstances, acceleration can be kept low. Initial torque should also remain low. I never found myself going above 10. Another thing which helps with braking is brake balance. One wants to set the front at 8, while keeping the rear at 5. Given weight transfers towards the front under braking, you always want to have the front balance slightly higher. But don't go crazy. This is a special case given it's a rear engine car and weight transfer under braking is violent. For the most part, this should be enough to improve the drivability of the Yellowbird, even if we can do a bit more. One of the main problems at low speeds happens to be turbo life. The stock gear ratios are quite long and only amplify these issues. This can be fixed with our good friend the racing gearbox, and a trick simply called the gear trick, which will make each gear closer and maintain the engine in its optimal rep range. First you want to push the final gear slider all the way to the right. Once this is done, you want to move the auto slider all the way back to 1. Now you can move and adjust the final gear depending on the circuit, and by the love of god, don't ever touch the auto slider again or you'll have to do this again. I find the final gear between 3500 and 3800 happens to give the best balance between acceleration and top speed, while maintaining the car at optimal reps through slower corners. The Yellowbird comes with 469 horsepower stock, which is quite a lot, but it can be increased to 500 with a racing intercooler and oil change. This is the setup I use for most of my races. I find adding turbo upgrades is unnecessary, given it already has enough power, even if there is a single exception later in this video. All of these changes put together shall make the car more consistent and able to play to its strengths, based on its rear engine layout. I do have to thank T Kanji for his help, especially as he looked into the hidden stats of each car. His tuning advice has been invaluable to me in the last month regarding the quirks of Gran Turismo. You should subscribe to his channel if you wish to know these games to the detail. Besides, who else in this platform races with a Mercedes? We wouldn't be able to see the hidden stats of each car if it wasn't thanks to the Gran Turismo modding community and the release of Spec TV. Thank you for allowing us to comprehend how every car truly works. With all these changes completed, it is time to race. First comes the Supercar Festival, which has 5 different races to tackle. I find these races are quite interesting given the requirements are open for a wide variety of cars, unless you want to race a concept car. Who will want to race a one-off anyway? Never mind. It's worth mentioning, one doesn't need an absurd amount of power to be competitive in this series. Handling happens to be a vital part of builds for this event. Given races are long and tire wear starts to be a handicap during the final laps. Another thing to consider is the fact that opponents in these races tend to drive cars which struggle on corners. Outside a few exceptions like the Volkswagen W12, which of course the player cannot use. At least I don't have to face one during the first race at Seoul, even if the Pagani Sound is a competitive rival as well. The long main straight showcases an unfair fixable flaw of the Yellowbird, the fact that it is a brick and has high drag. It struggles to accelerate compared to other cars despite being light and having a generous amount of power. It doesn't help that Seoul maintains the trend of urban circuits where it can be difficult to overtake without resorting to contact, even if this braking zone is always challenging given how narrow the road is. At least I didn't send the 4 GT into a wall, but second place is mine now. The sound in front has a comfortable lead, but it doesn't take long before I shrink our gap in half and manage to overtake it by the end of this lap. Not even rolling starts will save the sound or the rest of the grid for that matter, because I keep pulling away from them after each lap. While I had some slower laps during the second half of the race, with my best laps being on the 1 minute mark, the Yellowbird has enough pace to hold the lead. Who will have thought? But there are 4 races more, and we don't jump to conclusions in this channel. The next race takes place at Fuji Speedway, where I have a massive advantage in the shape of a grid start. Cars with this amount of power usually experience lots of wheel spin off the line. The Yellowbird, however, manages to avoid this thanks to its engine layout. With all the weight over the rear wheels, those 500 horsepower make their way to the tarmac and leave the entire field behind by the first corner. It's nice to have a clear, proper circuit to let the Yellowbird loose. The middle section with its wide and long turns is another area where its engine layout shines. Even if some throttle modulation and brake tapping is required to achieve a perfect line, this is a slower, in reality, but it beats touching the grass. Such are the compromises I got to make. Another area of Fuji which tests 
hits the yellower at its long breaking zones. While I think this car has worse brakes than others, I find this isn't a big issue, because one has to brake way earlier for the car to do its magic anyway. Given one has to find these braking zones which aren't shared with other cars, a few accidents might happen while finding these new zones. At least my cuts aren't intentional, respecting the circuit's layout. Just don't look at my live streams, I swear, I always make clean maneuvers, I never crash into other racers or use creative racing lines. Even with these mistakes on my part, the Yellowbird manages to secure a victory at Fuji Speedway, which takes us to New York, another circuit with long braking zones, given it's mostly composed of long straights and 90 degree turns. I find the first turn is the toughest one, because the braking zone right before it has a slight turn which is easy to miss. Everything gets worse with traffic blocking your path. There is a bit of hustling, while I'm faster than the Salinas 7 I have to brake way earlier and end up losing my position. The slower area of New York allows you to overtake opponents with ease, even if some contact might take place, given it's tough to fit two cars in here. Even more so when there are white supercars. Good luck fitting anything bigger than a Ford Ka in New York. I suppose Ford sent the wrong car here. The GT isn't a match for my Yellowbird, even if it comes back for vengeance at the final turn of the circuit, only to fade into obscurity for the rest of the race. I set my sights on the leading set set 2 during the second lap, a car which never saw the light of day but the rules don't apply for our Gran Turismo overlords. I admit the brakes really slow my pace down in New York, but I'm able to accelerate fast enough to recover in the straights until I can finally overtake and secure the lead. Even if it did turn into me though, it doesn't matter because our gap only grows with each passing lap, scoring another victory, and I'm glad because I didn't want to spend an extra second surrounded by buildings. Midfield Raceway makes for a nice return to form, where I finally meet the Volkswagen W12. This concept car clearly outclasses the entire field and tends to be the car to beat whenever it appears. There is also a Cadillac Sien on the field, which is really fast and can be a threat. These cars have downforce from stock, meaning they have an almost unfair advantage at the first corner of the circuit. This is a blind uphill section, followed by a fast downhill turn which can end in disaster. I'm forced to brake much earlier than usual in order to place the car properly. Such is the magic of reverse layout circuits and corners which were intended to be taken in a different manner. I remain quite close to the W12, however, it doesn't take long before it falls to second place. It does put up a good fight however, as it remains quite close to me through the entire race, being right next to me for the final lap. I admit I was scared to see that split and realized the CN was right behind us too. Guess we have a three-way battle for the victory here. Or so would you like to believe? They didn't even have a single chance to overtake me. Picture is mine. Who needs modern cars? Embrace turbo lag. <laughs> Only one race remains on the Supercar Festival and it happens to be my favorite, 6 laps at Infinite Raceway, the most technical circuit on the entire series. This is the race where good handling cars shine above the rest, especially in the first section of the circuit, and the Yellowbird can hang with them just fine. It has traction control at 1 to cope with the taller curves, which sometimes can force unwanted wheel spin, yet you kind of want to take them at times. I guess now I need a team manager screaming at me to stop doing so. It takes no time to make work of the field, securing first place by the end of the first lap. The W12 and CN are also part of this grid, but they are stuck behind traffic which means I can use this opportunity to build a lead over them, until they sort their way past the rest of the pack. Another car which does just fine it seems is the Salinas 7, because nobody can get past it until the final lap of the race. By the time the W12 climbs to second place, I have 2 seconds over it. Sure, I missed a braking zone and lost a bit of time by the end, but it doesn't matter, picture is mine. Probably the Yellowbird can beat Supercar Festival without breaking a sweat or running absurd amounts of power, even if 500 horsepower is quite a lot. While yes, the Supercar Festival is an interesting set of races, there is a championship which I find better as it is more challenging. The European Championship takes place across 5 tracks which test cars to their limits, along with opponents which are on the same pace as our previous rivals. The first race takes place in Opera Paris, an urban circuit which has quite a reputation. I admit I've grown to like this circuit even if the reverse layout is still somewhat annoying. My main rival this time is an SLR McLaren, a car which has more power than the Yellowbird, yet it's quite heavy at the same time. It obviously starts on the lead in true Gran Turismo fashion, forcing me to overtake the entire field on the first lap. They didn't present a challenge anyway, and the SLR does struggle given its size in these tighter corners. There isn't room for two cars, fair enough, but it got first place in a fair manner, a position which I hold until the end of the race, despite missing a braking zone which allowed the SLR to recover 
recover around 2 seconds, just to show how expensive mistakes can be, especially in longer races like this. By the end, my tires have 2 moods, but they decide to cooperate so I can win the race without major incidents. The second race presents a jump in difficulty as it takes place in Grand Bali, and it's 5 laps long. This is a test for any car running on sport tires, given many of them will end up falling apart without a good setup and losing to race. The yellow bird once again shines at the start, gaining a speed much faster than the rest of opponents. I even score a double overtake at the first corner, given it's me, the SLR and a red Chisetta V16, a returning character of the yellow bird lore. I didn't expect to secure a lead this early, however Grand Valley is a tricky circuit given it has a couple of sections where the yellow bird struggles. I find it struggles the most in the slower area of the circuit. This set of corners after the final tunnel can be hard to tackle, because your car tends to be at an angle, and one has to break or alright miss the following turn, and this car doesn't like breaking and turning at the same time. It's one of those cases where one has to think a few corners ahead. The first corner presents a similar issue but at higher speeds. I like to believe I got better after each lap, all I got to do is make sure the car is pointing right where I want it to be, so I can power my way out of the first turn, which is quite wide and lends itself quite nicely to my approach. My only rival are the cones scattered all over the circuit. It doesn't matter how many soldiers you send, Con Army, I will take care of every single one of them, no matter the circumstances. This race was a crushing victory, I think we can all agree. Next up comes a classic of motorsports, the two laps of Le Mans. Wait, are you sure it's two laps? Yeah, why will a second guess my judgement? It has to be right. This is a circuit which suits my opponents to a degree. The SLR has better top speed, and the Chisetta, funny enough, can be competitive. The Dunlop bridge curve is also quite tricky for the Yellowbird. I find it's difficult to place the car, but far from impossible. Then again, everything is much harder with cold tires. Something to note is the fact that we are racing at the start one, meaning it's a variant with chicanes. This isn't a small detail given the Yellowbird suffers under braking and will be reaching top speed in these straights, meaning I got to brake much earlier than my opponents as usual, even more so in this case. I admit I got a bit creative there in order to rescue my race, just a tiny bit. I do have a better line for the second chicane, a much better line in fact, which allows me to make a move on the SLR after coming back into the straightaway. However, the SLR isn't too happy and it decides to ram into me as I'm braking. Our difference on speed makes me lose control, but the Chisetta decides to join as I'm recovering, creating some sort of German slash Italian sandwich. After all I done for you Chisetta, and this is how you pay me. It doesn't matter because I recover first place shortly after, only to be rammed while I'm breaking by the Chisetta. The Vendetta arc comes to an end after Understeer gets the best of it before heading straight into a sand trap. Deserved. Despite the chaotic first lap, it was an easy race as the SLR couldn't catch up to me. Next up, it's everyone's favorite race, Monaco, which lives up to its fame and presents a somewhat tame race where I score another victory over 10 seconds on the SLR too. But the final race of the championship is my main rival, two laps at the Nürburgring itself. One of the most annoying parts of the green hell comes with overtakes. These cars are wide and one wants to sort through the pack as quickly as possible, because otherwise the leading opponents pull away from the rest. It's like GT rewards this sort of dirty races with its rolling starts, unless I tackle a qualifying session which is as long as the race itself. The back markers make honor to the roll and grant me the podium without a fight, leaving the Chisetta which cannot go too wide and goes straight into the grass. Then again, there isn't much room to fit two cars here. The SLR doesn't present a fight either, securing the lead for the time being. I did struggle at the final section of the track. I made a slight mistake with the setup this time as I didn't raise the right height enough. The springs on the yellow board are rather stiff and even at their lightest setting, they aren't soft enough for the new Evergreen, an issue which can be corrected by maxing out right height, even if the SLR is grateful as it takes the lead from me once again. Doesn't matter because the SLR is helpless against the might of the yellow bird with its massive turbos. Who needs the new Mercedes? It remains close to me through the second lap, at least through the first section. I do have to slow my pace down once again for the final section, but this time I keep the car on the road, which is enough to hold my lead. Even if the SLR isn't too happy and tries to take me out before the end of the race, it doesn't work. Not this time, SLR. You'll have to leave knowing you are second best. Well, yes, the yellow bird has proven to be quite competitive against all sorts of 
opponents, there is a tier above. There is one car which is treated as a gift from God by most of the Gran Turismo community, a car which has no flaws and absolutely nobody can touch, the Toyota 88C slash B, better known by the name of its sponsor, Minolta, a manufacturer of cameras. A small piece of trivia for you all, this is a proper tire chewing race car which is far beyond the Yellowbirds League, until you add one equalizing element, rain. This is to Cuba wet, one of the many events included under special conditions. If one does this racing hard, the only opponent tends to be an LMP or Group C car. After adding a stage 4 turbo kit, replacing the tires with racing, super soft slicks and changing the LSD settings, it is time to challenge the so-called god of GT4. It won't be an easy fight as these events have a penalty system in which one cannot come in contact with their opponent. Even if this rule doesn't apply to the AI, life imprisonment was created for the person who thought this was a good idea. At first glance this seems impossible, the Minolta has better brakes and downforce to help it, but Rain manages to slow it down through the corners where I have the advantage. You see, even if I have to break a town before each corner, I happen to have better grip on corner exit, as the Minolta struggles to put its power down. While it's not easy to control almost 800 horsepower in Tsukuba, I manage to place myself right at the Minolta's side. I do have to let it pass as I don't want to risk getting rammed or gaining an undeserved penalty. I make another dive on the main harping before the back straight, where I get the inside line and take first place. I pretty much consume all of the air surrounding the circuit with those stage 4 turbos, a worthy sacrifice to leave them in all to dust. Even if the final corner dares to disagree with me, this is a turn where I would love to have downforce, but I don't, leaving the door open for the Minolta to attack. However, I do have the advantage at corner exit and manage to outpull it before the finish line. Taking first place right before the second lap, I managed to outpull a Minolta. Let that sink in for a moment. Our gap continues to grow as the race continues. While I lose time at the final corner, I am much faster through the other sections and that is enough to even the splits. By the final lap I have 2 seconds over the Minolta, which happens to be the final split. Even if I have a 3 second lead for a brief period of time, guess to Cuba is covered in Minolta tiers. For some bizarre reason, somewhat at Polyphony thought the Yellowbird could be used at dirt and snow races, so I might as well take this thing for a rally race at Swiss Alps. While our opponent is less powerful, it has a proper all-wheel drive system, which should give it an advantage. I should say I removed the stage 4 turbo for this. It was only used in Tsukuba. The car is running the usual 500 horsepower tune, but this is enough to leave the Lancer behind. This is one of the most absurd experiences I ever had in Gran Turismo 4, because the car works and it doesn't lose grip under any circumstances. Sure, you can't floor it, but that is to be expected. I won't say it's easy or competitive, but you can win dirt races with it. That is kind of the point of this video, really, showcasing the different options one has in Gran Turismo 4. While taking this piece on dirt races isn't clever, it's surely competitive in a plethora of events, outright crushing them in many cases, and it does beg the question of which other cars are waiting there to be discovered. While I understand some people aren't interested in modifying cars and making setups, these are an important part of the game as they can make all sorts of cars more predictable, or improve them in many other cases. Never underestimate the power of these sliders, even if they won't save your life, you still got to drive these cars in order to get the best out of them. This vital information has made its way to you thanks to all of my Patreons. We thank them as follows. Or amateur racers? Professional racers? And world champions. Line Dev, See What Happens Racing UK, Whiskey Tuesday, Sundere Kiseli, Enzo Lassonieri, Raciel, Hunter Kaufman, Josh Big, Crusader Glenn, Jade, Lonnie Murray, Vicecom, Lucky Lucky, Matim19, and Espriel. If you wish to support my endeavors as these wonderful people have done, you can find a link to my Patreon in the description of this video. You can enjoy early access to my videos along with a special role on our Discord server. All of this is starting at $3 a month. These videos are funded by my supporters. Each one makes a massive difference. If we manage to reach 50 patrons, I will do a 9 hour live stream tackling an endurance race with a Ford K in Gran Turismo 4. If you have enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like and share it on different platforms as it helps the channel by reaching a new audience. And if you didn't like it, leave a dislike. With that said, I hope you all have enjoyed this video. Take care and bye for now.